You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the KTPF Reload Show. In case you're wondering what the Reload Show is about, if you haven't heard previous shows, these are the interviews that were conducted by good friends of mine, Steve and Sue Taggart, in the days of the KTPF Radio Show. Their own radio show ran for just over four years, broadcasting every week for over three hours. I joined them in the last 18 months of the show's run, but eventually the guys felt they'd just about had enough. It was a monumental effort to keep broadcasting every week for three hours. It was a wonderful show. But unfortunately, they're no longer involved, and the shows have just sort of sat in the archives. So I thought it would be nice to bring them back to life and bring you the interviews that the guys conducted over those four years. They include some of the most interesting people within the world of the paranormal and some not so well known, but still, nevertheless still very interesting. We even have one or two rather unusual shows, including a live seance and um, other things along those lines. Anyway, hopefully you enjoy tonight's show. And this is the KTPF Reload Show. Enjoy. This program deals with themes of an adult nature and is intended for a mature audience. You're in the right place. Place. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk Radio. You hear us, we hear you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the KTPF Community Talk Show. My name is Suzanne. And I'm Steve. And we are here keeping the paranormal friendly. Now, what's on tonight's show? Well, in in August 1977, single parents Peggy Hodgson called police to her rented home in Enfield after two of her four children claimed that furniture was moving and knocking sounds were heard on walls. The children included Margaret, age 13, Janet, age 11, Johnny, age 10, and Billy, age 7. Later claims included... Allegedly demonic voices, loud noises, thrown rocks and toys, overturned chairs and levitation of the children. A police officer, or rather a police woman, uh, even signed an affidavit to say that she had seen the chair move. Uh, there was more than 30 witnesses to the sta- strange incidents. Desperate for an explanation about what could be taken place in their home, the family turned to the Society of Psychical, if that's the right word, um, it's research, a respective scientific body that examines cases of alleged hauntings from any academic perspective. In t- in, it sent two investigators, Guy Lyon Playfair and Morris Gross, to examine the evidence. Reports of further incidents in the house attracted considerable press attention and the story was covered in Britain. British newspapers such as the Daily Mail and Daily Mirror until reports came to an end in 1979. The Enfield Ghost is one of those cases in the paranormal that has always fascinated me. But what is the truth about the case? I'm hoping Guy, in talking about the Enfield case, can give me a little insight into Poltergeist, including some details from a new study which used some recordings from the Enfield case. Mr. Playfair, welcome to the show. It's been great having you on. Um, everybody was interested in, in the Enfield case, um, and I hope you don't mind talking to us about it. Well, I'll try and think of something new to say about it, if I can. That, that's the thing, isn't it, really? Um, we've just been saying that uh, I think it's something that, uh, you know, you've, you've basically done to death, isn't it, really? Well, yes, and, and there's a TV uh, serial coming up based on it. Oh, really? uh, well, it hasn't been announced yet, actually, so I better not say too much, but it, it's said to be going to be announced this week oh, right. from Sky. 
we'll have to look out for that. So you, I'm sure they let you know about it, yeah. Yeah. So, um, right, okay. Hopefully everyone can hear you okay. So, uh, can you hear it okay, Steve? Yeah, it's coming through. Right. Uh, just keep it there. Okay. Just wait right, for okay. It. So, um, first of all, how did you get involved in the case? And uh, can you give us a basic outline of what it was about? Uh, not in less than about three hours, but I'll, I'll try. I can understand that. Well, I got involved quite by, by accident. Um, so I went along to the Society for Psychical Research, SPR, in August of 1977 for their monthly lecture, which happened to be about poltergeists. Mm -hmm. And I sat next to a fellow called Maurice Gross, whom I hardly knew. He was a new member, and I'd only met him a couple of times and just sort of said hello, and he said that he'd read one of my books and liked it, so I just said thank you, and that was that, really. And um, uh, at the, after the end of this talk about poltergeists by um, a librarian, actually, who it was, who gave a very good talk about the sort of history of the subject and made it all sound rather, rather academic and... Um, something that used to happen, but obviously it doesn't happen anymore. Mm. And then at question time at the end, um, Morris jumped up and said he was investigating a case right now. And there was a kind of horrified um, gasp. <laughs> and um, he said he'd like some help. And since I was sitting right in front of him, I, I couldn't escape. <laughs> so I said rather sort of offhandedly, I'm just, let me know if you get desperate, because I didn't really want to. I had all sorts of other things to do, and um, yeah. I was also hoping to go on holiday, which I hadn't done for several, well, at least two years, because I'd been writing a very long book, mm. which had just come out, and I was due for a bit of a rest. And uh, then what happened was on, that was on Thursday, and on Sunday, lunchtime, I was listening to the BBC's World at One, and uh, who, who should pop up but Morris, broadcasting from from Enfield, together together with a BBC reporter, R Rosalind Morris, who did a superb job, stood up all night and then went straight into the studio and did a very, very uh, concise piece on, on the whole case. And it sort of took off from there, and so I, I realized that this was a case that I just had to go and look at, and yeah. uh, went along on the Monday and stayed there for 14 months. 14 months? God. Yeah. In the beginning, what kind of phenomena did you personally experience that convinced you something was definitely happening? Well, as soon as I got through the door, it was, it was the atmosphere. Um, they, they were scared stiff. I mean, they were completely confused and, and didn't know what on earth to do. And they'd already appealed to the police and the social services and the church and the welfare and everything else. And finally, in desperation, they, they phoned the Daily Mirror because that, that was their paper. And they weren't out for any money. They didn't ask for any, and they never got any. Um, but they, they wanted they wanted help from somebody. And... Um, as luck would have it, the, um, the Daily Mirror's chief reporter was uh, George Fellows, who was a very decent fellow and very concerned for the welfare of the family. And he he, told, he, he said he, he'd call the SPR. That's how we got involved. It was entirely thanks to the Daily Mirror. And they deserve all, all credit for, for doing a very, very uh, worthy act, which mm. today they wouldn't do that sort of thing now. I mean, journal, journalism in the 70s was a lot more considerate and ethical than it, than it is now. So um, we were lucky, and, and um, we were treated pretty well, fairly by the press on the whole. We didn't, didn't have any really, really um, bad times. So that's how it all began. And um, as I say, well, what convinced me was the fact that the family were, were all absolutely terrified. You know, they would sleep with a light on yeah. all night which you don't normally do. No. And quite often they wouldn't even go into a room on their own during the day. Mm. And I heard one of the girls say to the other, you know, would, would you come in come in there with me? And they, they, they didn't want to be on their own at all. I mean, they really were absolutely terrified. And why the hell would anybody fake that? Yeah, yeah. 
So um, for you, what was the scariest thing that happened? Ooh. Well, quite a choice, really. It's hard, it's hard to say. I don't think there was any one any any worse than the others. There were just so many of them. The, the, I suppose the most impressive was really when people outside the house got um, involved and the um, lollipop lady across the road mm. saw Janet floating up and down through the window. And she must have been at least three feet in the air to be visible from the street level. And then, of course, this large cushion appeared on the roof in full view of the baker, who still hasn't got over it, <laughs> even today. He just won't talk about it. Well, today, we tried to get hold of him about two years ago, and he just wouldn't uh, discuss it. It scared the hell out of him. You know, he's walking along the pavement directly yeah. towards the house. And so nobody was opening windows or in the garden or anywhere near it. And suddenly this very large sofa cushion appears on the roof, just mm. from one frame to the next, as it were. And that was done in public. Well, all kinds of people saw that, but it, he was the only one who was prepared to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And luckily we grabbed him um, pretty soon after the event before he'd um, clammed up, which, which he now has. So it was things like that that um, were pretty unusual and, mm. and uh, better better witnessed than you normally get. And it, because this was in a, a fairly busy residential street, and um, there, there was lots of people. Um, the house was right on the street front, and um, it wasn't isolated at all. It, it was semi-detached. They had next-door neighbours who were well aware of what was going on, and they could hear quite a lot of it. So it was it was well witnessed right from day one. Right. Now, why why do you think Janet was more affected that more than her sister? Because I believe she was the focus of the activity. It, well, they both were. Uh, uh, Janet more so, certainly, yes. Um, that, that, that we simply don't know. I mean, the, the poltergeists do, do appear to attach themselves to one single individual, which is very often a teenage um, um, girl or boy, they can be both, and uh, sometimes to m much older. I mean, we've had, um, Mo Maurice and I did a case where, where the only occupants were a young uh, couple in their 30s, mm. no children at all, um, just a husband and wife and a rather, rather sort of moribund dog. So uh, you don't have to have children, but they do seem to help. I mean, it seems to be something to do with um, available energy. I don't know. The teenagers certainly have more of that than most of us. Yeah. But, uh, but the whole thing is a total mystery. We really don't know anything about poltergeists at all, and, and um, I don't try to pretend that I do. No. All, all I can tell you is how they behave. This is it. Now, we've been, got a couple of questions in the um, chat room, yeah. and... Uh, Damon is and the Viscount is similar questions actually. Um, what do you think when people claim that it was all fake? Off, <laughs> other than the what, why would anyone want to fake it back in those days? But the Viscount says many people say that the daughter was faking it. Example: whistling and barking noises coming from Janet's general direction. Well, I'm afraid that won't do because we actually had a professional speech therapist up there, and she heard this. Um, voice and said she'd never heard anything like it and we also got a, got a professor of phonetics from London University to lend us a laryngograph which you clamp onto the neck and you record signals mm. coming from the larynx and this established um, beyond any doubt that the voice was not made by the normal vocal cords. Now you can't do that and it, um, it's what they use for sort of growly voices on radio commercials. Yeah. You know, talking about horror films and that kind of thing. Mm. Well, you can't keep that up for very long without getting one hell of a sore throat. No. And Janet could keep it up for, for literally for hours. Really? So that, that excuse, I'm sorry, that won't do. They've got to do better than that. There was a researcher, Anita Gregory. She claimed that the, the uncle was told her that uh, he thought Janet had taught herself to talk in a deep voice and loved to trick strangers. Yes, Anita Gregory went there, I think, twice. Yeah. I went there about 125 times. Yeah. I think I'm in a better position to judge what went on there than she was. 
understand that. And she seemed to be determined to debunk the thing before she even got there. So um, you get used to that sort of thing. It goes with a job. You know, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, she was in a very small minority of, of uh, yeah. nitpickers. And I simply don't believe that the, the uncle, he, he was very supportive of Janet um, all, all the way through. And I don't, I don't think he would have accused her of anything. Um, he certainly would have told me if he caught her cheating in any way. So I'm sorry, I, I, I reject that testimony completely. Did they ever play any pranks? On yes, they did. And we knew that. And yeah. we knew, we knew, and we all knew. And, and I didn't make a big deal of it at all because it's their house. They can do what they like. It's oh, not yeah. my job as an investigator to tell children how to behave in their own home, is it? No, this is it. And also, for children to imitate what they see going on around them, that's how they learn. I mean, that's the basis of all education. Mm. And it's very, very common on poltergeist cases that once they've been going for a few weeks or longer, that the um, children think this is a sort of new new game or whatever, and they, they, they join in. There's also evidence, which I've seen, where they can do kind of unconscious cheating, where, where something seems to get into them, and they do things without knowing why. I mean, I, I've had one very clear case of that. So th this is not quite as simple as, as these no. so-called skeptics like to pretend. Do you think it's possible that they're thinking about what they did fake is making them doubt what actually happened? Do you think that could be the possibility? Well, what they did fake was so easy to discover. I mean, what, one lovely example, which I never forget, was when I, I got back from uh, the pub where I'd been having my evening meal and found my tape recorder was missing. Oh. And the girl said, oh, yeah, the ghost stole it or something. So I had a look around, and I found it immediately in a cupboard. And they took on to turn it off. It was still recording. Mm. So they recorded the evidence themselves. You know, come on, let's put it in the cupboard and tell him the poltergeist told him. Oh. <laughs> and they really weren't very good at it. And they... <laughs> After a while, I, I just sort of said, please don't play around with my tape recorder because they were quite expensive in those days. And we, we just don't, we never mentioned, referred to it again. I mean, it was no, normal kind of 12-year-old behavior. It's nice to know that with all the fear that they were going through, they could still act like children, if you understand what I'm saying. Well, we almost encouraged them in some ways. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried to um, defuse the situation right from the start and um, get rid of this sort of idea of, of, of demonic possession or terror or something. I just said, look, this is just a sort of, it's like, it's like a dose of the measles. It'll pass. It, it's, it's a disease. Yeah. And it's not your fault. It just happened. It'll go away. And, and eventually, of course, it did. But it, it mm. took much longer than, than normal. There was an incident with marbles, I believe. Um, <coughs> Several, yeah. Could you say where the children were when these ha this happened? I believe they fell from the ceiling or something, and toys, Lego or something. Oh, we had Lego all over the place, and, and the, um, the unfortunate Daily Mirror photographer got whacked on the forehead very hard by a piece of Lego while he was actually taking a photo. God. So, I mean, who threw it? You know, nobody was throwing it in the photo. You could see exactly where all the children's hands were, and... Um, also, you can't throw a piece of Lego hard enough to make a large bruise on the poor fellow's forehead. And I saw that the uh, um, day after it happened. It was a great big red blob in the middle of his forehead. Mm. It was quite nasty, and, and if it had gone into his eye, that would have been the end of that one. Can I ask, um, on a technical side, what, what um, equipment was used during the case? Oh, lots of it. The... the um, the mirror photographer had all kinds of uh, super um, uh, computer-driven flash, which would fire four times a minute, no, well, four times a second, mm. and could take little sort of sequences of moving film, which we got several of those, where you get, I think it's six actually, still still photos taken at int intervals of about about. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but it's it's about about a second or, or less. So you get a, you get a little brief moving clip, which is very very important. We got quite a few of those, which um, are, are very good evidence of things moving without anybody anywhere near them. Several of those, and um, Maurice Gross had a very large reel to reel tape recorder. Mm. BBC um, reporter had a, a ewer 
which is absolutely the top of the range, you know, the, the, um, the one they use for outside broadcast, perfect, wonderful quality and uh, very um, <coughs> reliable. And of course, the first thing it did was, was not work. <laughs> uh, it, it jammed the tapes uh, completely um, solid in, into the machine and the technician, BBC, had to take it apart. Mm. So um, he said he'd never seen that before. But then uh, he hadn't put it out on a poltergeist case before, so that, that's what happens. So, um, talking about the uh, equipment and stuff, uh, Dave and Liz, is it Dave and Liz? Sorry. Yeah, Dave and Liz Sorry. And, and Dave Lloyd. Dave and Liz and Dave Lloyd would like to know that, um, uh, could I ask you why, what you feel um, about the new technology be, technology being used on investigations and today, you, you to such as music? spirit boxes, thermal image cameras, and full spectrum cameras. Well, thermal imaging is interesting. You should say that because it's just been done by, by um, an Australian colleague of mine, Paul Cropper, who is um, rapidly becoming one of the most um, diligent poltergeist chasers in the world. He's been yeah. several other countries in search of them and he's just written a whole book called uh, Australian Poltergeist which is um, quite an eye opener, cases we never heard of from Australia on, on the last, on the case from the 1990s in a little place with the delightful name of Humpty Doo in the Northern Territories um, the local TV people came in and they did bring a thermal imaging camera and they were able to film stones that had just been thrown and find that there were no fingerprints on them because they, your fingerprints show up very, very, very clearly on um, thermal imaging. And also the stones were uniformly hot all over, which can only be done by deliberately heating them. And, and uh, even in a uh, fairly hot Aus Australian climate, this was... Um, you know, they weren't just warm, they were hot. Mm. And he filmed them repeatedly until the stone cooled down and you could see uh, uh, the whole process from start to finish. I mean, that, that's, that's very precise evidence. Mm, so that's been done, yes. And then that certainly will be done again, at least in Australia, where they yeah. seem to be have a, a more, more interest in these things than, than here. If you could, would you go back with them? Um or, if, you know, would you have used today's technology if, if it was now? Well, I wouldn't do a case like that again. I mean, one is enough. You know, they are extremely I understand exhausting. that. But I was just thinking, if it was today the case, would you use today's technology, like spirit boxes and stuff like that? Well, uh, I, I, I don't want... I don't... Not, think, not really, no. I mean, we, we, um, we get a lot of reports in the SPR... We have a special committee for um, members of the public who send in um, accounts of all the things that happened to them, and we try to investigate as many as we can. And we have we have done. Um, colleagues of mine have investigated other other poltergeists with various sort of bits and pieces and things. But um, I've always rather felt that good old-fashioned reporting with, with a tape recorder and a notebook is, is all you need. Um, nothing ever seems to be conclusive. I mean, you no. you can prove um, well some things you can. I mean, like, like we um, we managed to get the wrapping something. Oops! Oh, sorry, my mouse trap just went off. It wasn't a poltergeist. Um, <laughs> so I didn't like it. Um, where was I? Um, yeah, we, we, we recorded a lot of these knocking, rapping sounds at Enfield, and um, I, I thought at the time it might be interesting to analyze them on a spectro oscilloscope, which, which shows the um, what they call the acoustic signature. Yeah. And we, we couldn't do that at the time. We didn't know anybody who had the equipment. And um, luckily, one of our members, Barry Colvin, uh, who has all, all the gear, he's got his own laboratory. And he did analyze about 12 recordings from different cases, including three or four of mine from, from Brazil, where I used to be. And he found in every single case the other guys' raps do not look like normal ones at all. In fact, you cannot fake them without very elaborate uh, methods, which the average 12-year-old girl would not have. 
No. And so th that's more evidence. Now, we do we do manage to get some proper evidence on these things. We don't just sort of fool around, you know. We do try and contribute to the, to the sum of um, scientific knowledge about these things, and we have. Yeah. And um, the the apart from anything else, th this technique is very useful for distinguishing genuine raps from fake ones. Mm. Because if somebody is faking one, we'll catch them easily, straight off. Yeah, yeah. When Janet admitted to faking phenomena, uh, this is from Dave and Liz, um, uh, to see what, um, if you and Morris could tell, <laughs> what went through your mind and what did you think what made her fake it? I really didn't think about it. I mean, look, for heaven's sake, this was children... Yeah. Behaving in their own house, and I, I don't expect them to sort of sit, sit neatly in rows and no. reading their Bibles. I mean, there they, they, they were a couple of very lively East End kids in their in their own their own house, and we we were visitors, guests. Hmm. I didn't tell them what to do. I mean, that, that's that's not my. Right. No. I really didn't worry about it. I mean, they didn't do it very often, and they weren't very good at it. <laughs> so um, we just we just didn't make a big deal out of it no, at all. No. No. Did you at any time think that they were at risk to their lives? No, certainly not. No, you didn't think that anyone was going to, you know, uh, poltergeist wasn't going to hurt them? Well, um, uh, Janet did have some very um, severe, what looked like trances. They were, they were a bit a bit concerning, I mean, because, again, nobody would do anything about it. They, they, um, her mother took her to the local doctor and he just gave her a pill and sent her away and they, they called in the child welfare psychiatrist who, who thought the whole thing was a complete joke and he, he just went away without doing anything at all. I think he should have been struck off for negligence and um, they, could, they couldn't get anybody to give him any help at all. We, we, we were there one night when, when she was having a very violent... Uh, it looked rather like an epileptic fit. I mean, there may be a distant connection between the two. Mm. And the, doc the emergency night doctor came along and gave her 10 cc of Valium, which we actually saw her take. And two hours later, she was flung out of bed, sound asleep. And again, how the hell do you fake that? No, this is a... No, she should have been absolutely knocked out after that um, mm. dose. And yet, and she, well, in fact, she did, she was still asleep when we found her across the room. Sat absolutely out of it. You know. So that was a bit hairy, but then luckily, as luck would have it, or whatever, a couple of friends of mine from Brazil turned up and they, they did a sort of spiritist uh, routine and, and completely cured her straight off. Yeah. And that never happened again. Mm. Um, it was approved. Uh, it was proved at time that Janet had the ability to bend men metal without touching them. Yes, she did, uh, and that was also recorded on, on a strain gauge, which you can't fake. Yeah. Uh, without, well, you can, but n not easily. And it was supervised by, by a, a student from Birkbeck College who, who knows how to operate these things. Uh, yes, yeah, she did. I mean, we we did that at the suggestion of. Um, Matthew Manning, who, who came along um, to, to sort of encourage the family and tell them that these things do get better, and he, he thought it was a good way of drawing off the energy, as it were, because that, that's what he did when he had a very severe poltergeist attack when he was at school, and he decided to do uh, automatic writing and drawing as a, as a way of, um, as he saw it, of sort of diverting the energy, and it certainly worked. Yeah. For him. And he stopped, he stopped bending spoons and he kept on doing um, paintings and so And then he became a healer, a very good one. Mm. He, he cured me of a, of a very unpleasant uh, problem. So you don't think a metal bending was down to telekinesis then? Well, you can call it what you like. I mean, the, the fact is that she did um, actually uh, bend a teaspoon, which was wired up to a strain gauge. Yeah. And... Um, I can remember one day when we just found a bent spoon on the kitchen table, which everybody firmly denied having bent normally, and there was no reason why they should. Mm. And also found that um, the 
girls were, were, were extremely truthful. They never added to their stories at all. We would frequently question them again about something we asked them about several weeks previously. And they didn't change their stories ever. They, they were very sort of matter of fact and, and they, they, they stuck to what they'd observed and didn't make things up. They didn't have to. Um, one question that's come up in the chat room is, uh, were you contacted at all regarding the BBC's Ghost Watch um, episode that came on? <coughs> that, yes, I was. <laughs> Typical sort of sneaky way of doing it. They, they wanted, they told me they were doing a drama, fictional drama about poltergeists, and they wanted technical advice as to how they worked and so on. As soon as I read the script, I realized that it was a complete rip-off of a yeah. book. So I sued them. And perhaps we needn't go into that now, but uh -huh. I won. I had a very nice holiday on the proceeds. <laughs> so you finally got your holiday. I did. <laughs> and it was a very, I went to Denmark at a lovely time. Wow. And, um, well, I mean, don't really want to go into the details. To be honest with you, I'd heard so much about it, and I only really saw it last year, <laughs> and I didn't think much of it. But um, that's by the by. Um, Dave, Dave and Liz would like to know... Not Dave Lloyd, dear. Uh, sorry, I was looking at something else. Um, Dave and Liz would like to know, what got you interested in the paranormal? Oh, crumbs. Well, I'm not really interested in the paranormal, because I, I, I don't like the word. So, what what do, would you like to call it? Paranormal uh, research, or scientific research? Well, I'm interested in, in, in anything that I can write about. Uh, I've written all sorts of... Um, stuff about subjects that are entirely unrelated to poltergeist mm -hmm. and uh, more recently uh, um, haven't been in that sort of area at all. No. Um, I've been a member of the Society for Psychical Research for 40 years and written quite a lot of stuff from them about all kinds of things and uh, um, I'm really interested in anything that hasn't been explained. Yes. I think you could call it, uh, well, the, the word I prefer is uh, anomaly. Yeah. And anomalies. Is that why you joined the um, society? Um, I think I joined it when I was living in Brazil and working with a local group there. We were chasing after poltergeists where they had plenty of them going on. And oh. um, I met some of these mysterious um, psychic surgeons you know, who rip people open with their bare hands. And um, some interesting mediums, including... Uh, um, Chico Xavier, who, extraordinary um, man who, who's written, who wrote about 450 books in automatic writing, and um, uh, Brazil was, was where it was all happening in the 70s. It was it was quite exciting stuff. So when when I came back to England, um, 1975, I, I thought I'd join the SPR and uh, keep up to date with. with Developments over here, which mm. I, I have and still am. So, another question in the chat room is: uh, What do you think of mediums? <laughs> well, I mean, you say, well, "What do I think of people?" <laughs> They're all different, right? Um, some of them, are, I would say, were outstandingly good, mm -hmm. and some of them are completely useless. Yeah, I haven't had much luck with them. I have met one or two very good ones. Um, the best, I suppose, was the late Bertha Harris, who was quite well known in spiritualist circles, and she certainly was extremely accurate to clairvoyance. I mean, she could see things that she wasn't supposed to be able to see, mm. and um, she seemed to have some ability for precognition as well. And um, she, she was fascinating, and, and um, has a very good reputation for absolute honesty and integrity. And um, once actually gave a gave a sitting to to um, Winston Churchill, which she wouldn't give me any details about, but I think that's generally mm. established that she did that. Yeah, and um, uh, Matthew Manning is another medium I found very impressive. He he became a healer and um, cured me of a slip disc problem, which, which um, I tried about 15 different therapies for, which hadn't yeah. had any effect. 
And he, he, he cured it in one go. I mean, that was quite extraordinary. Yeah. And it was witnessed by an orthopedic surgeon who, who said, I just can't explain this. This is normally mm. takes at least two years for, for the ulnar nerve to regrow. And mine took about half an hour, so there you are. And that, that was me, so I know it happened. Yes, definitely. And, um, well, I suppose Uri Geller can be considered as a medium. I certainly was impressed by him. And we're still very good friends after 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I um, can't think of any others offhand, but there have been... Well, some of the Brazilian ones I met were very good. And... Um, on the whole, I tend to rather steer clear of them because they don't, they don't very often don't seem to lead anywhere. I mean, they come up with all kinds of wonderful remarks which you can't verify, and uh, yeah. I don't really need them. No. I, I mean, I, I just put that rather low down my scale of priorities. Right, so they don't use them at the society then? We don't use them at all. I mean, uh, um, people have, um, uh, members have been along to, check them out for themselves mm. and um, sometimes they they, they, they they witness things they find interesting and um, sometimes they don't so um, on the whole it's not really an area that majority of SPR members concentrate on okay. um, there are so many others which are rather more uh, amenable to investigation mm. Uh, going back to the um, the, the Enfield case, um, Dave Lloyd would like to know um, wherever it went. Sorry, uh, what was the overall conclusion of the case? What you mean, the end or the explanation? Um, both, really. What What did you think of the um, end? Well, the, the end was a colossal anticlimax, right? Because. Um, you know, if this was the film, uh, you, you'd expect sort of uh, dramatic exorcisms and screams yeah. and yells and so on. And we had none of that. And all we had was this rather taciturn Dutch medium hmm. who turned up a Dutch friend of mine, a journalist from Amsterdam, said he, he knew a man who said he could stop it. So he said, would I, would I like him to, to, to bring him over? And I said, yes, <laughs> we, we do want to stop it, please. Yeah. But are they? So he brought him over and he stopped it. I mean, that's it, really. He didn't apparently do anything much. No. Um, he, 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 he took the girls up the road and bought them an ice cream, which is nice. Yeah. And then he came back and he sat on his own in, in their bedroom alone while they were, they were waiting downstairs. And then he came downstairs and he just said, well, I think he's gone. And, and this may have been a brilliant piece of suggestion a sort of hypnotic suggestion, but whatever it was, it worked. And from that day on, we, we had um, only one very brief outburst a couple of months later, which was only a couple of days and not very serious. And then after that, nothing. So it really is sort of fade out rather than climax. Did I read somewhere there's a new study going on about it? Uh, what about Enfield? Or, or yes, about Enfield. Was there a new study going to be um, taken on it? Uh, not, that I, not that I can think of. They, they, um, there was another study of actually of us. I mean, we were investigated. Right. Boris Gross and I. They, they had a special committee at the SPR. Yeah. Um, called Epic Enfield Poltergeist Investigation Committee. Mm -hmm. Which was headed by um, lawyer Mary Rose Barrington, who's still with us, thankfully, and um, they questioned as many of the witnesses as they could, r rather as if they'd been in court. I mean, I mean, rather more gently, but they they questioned all the family and the chief investigators, and they concluded that the case was genuine. So, so um, that was that was useful. Right, it was something to do with using some of the recordings from the case, apparently. So that's probably what you're what you're talking about. Uh, well, we still got all the recordings, about mm. two hundred hours of it. Yeah. And um, they are in the process of being transcribed. Okay. Well, in fact, they, they have been transcribed. Yeah. Five hundred pages of A4 single spaced, which 
quite a lot. Mm. And um, they will eventually, I hope, find their way onto a disc so that people can come and listen to them. They, they can't yet, but they will. Mm. But it's a massive job and quite expensive, but we, we, we are getting there. Yeah. Uh, a couple of more questions um, on a different line of, of subject. Um, yeah. People want to know what you what you think of the uh, programs that are on TV, like The Ghost Adventures, Haunted Collector, Most Haunted. What's the best TV programs show that you've seen, or do you not watch them? Easy question. I don't have a TV set. Oh right. So that, that's the answer to that one. Okay. <laughs> I, I occasionally look at stuff on the on the iPlayer on the yeah. computer, but. Um, I'm not in the least interested in these sort of funny programs about ghosts. No, I've never seen any of them. Right, okay. Um, one thing I'd like to ask is, um, what have you learned about the poltergeist phenomena um, after all these years? Ooh. That's a very tough one, really. I mean, I, I've learned um, how, they, how they behave and roughly what to expect. Mm-hmm. But as to the actual explanation of why they happen, why they're so rare, because they are extremely rare, you know, yeah. they, they, it's impossible to say how, how, what percentage of people who suffer, but it's well under a fraction of 1%. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, um, far more likely to be struck by lightning than to have a poltergeist in, in your house. Yeah. It's, it's um, doesn't seem to make any sense to me why it should be so rare. I mean, if it happens at all, it should happen quite often. Mm. But everything else seems to happen quite often and, and um, or quite regularly and, and under certain conditions. But we, we, we can't, we really can't say what the conditions are. I mean, the, the most cases in, in uh, world literature, they tend to go for the unfortunate poorer classes rather than the rich ones. Yeah. Although there is, we are actually checking out a report right now that um, there was something that sounds very much like a poltergeist uh -huh. in the former residence of no less than Margaret Thatcher. Really? In um, Belgravia somewhere, what's it called? Yeah. Chester Square. Wow. And um, we're still working on that one. That could be quite fun. Um, it, it didn't last very long, and it was apparently only reported one particular incident, but it was a very odd one. Yeah. And, um, again, I think I, I'd like to wait until we yeah. have a bit more. We are trying to f track down the original security guard who was there, hmm. who is apparently willing to talk, but we can't, can't haven't yet found him. Right. So, um, that, that should be quite, quite fun. Yeah. Um, is the Enfield Ghost, um, oh, sorry, the Enfield Poltergeist case, rather, was that the first recorded one in England or, or anywhere? Or oh, nothing like it, no. no? I mean, they've been recorded since the 8th century. They have. Uh, the, the earliest one that's been probably written up was from the German town of Bingen. Uh, a certain lady, called, uh, I can't remember her name, um, in, in Bingen who, who, who got poltergeisted and, and um, some local, probably the local priest or somebody anyway, wrote a quite, quite detailed account of the case so that we had them around for more than a thousand years. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean they, they, um, the church has always taken an interest because yeah. they always assumed to be the work of the devil. Yeah. Thanks to Martin Luther, I think, who, who um, mm. wrote about them quite, quite often. He, he's one of the first to use the word, poltergeist. He didn't coin it as, as is sometimes suggested. It was definitely uh, in use in German in the uh, 15th century. And Luther, of course, wrote early in the 16th, and he referred to poltergeist as if, as if he assumed everybody would know what they were, and and also that they were the, the work of the devil. So that was that was the explanation, and it stuck for ages, and it, it still is. I mean, we, we get reports from all over the world yeah. um, in, in the SPR, from, uh, a lot of them from Africa, where, where they've got all sorts of beliefs in in. Um, Spirits of various kinds, and they, they ascribe it to, to that. And um, it's different in every culture. They've all got their own traditional belief system. And, um, and yet the phenomena are always the same. It, it, it's it's um, extraordinary how similar they all are. 
was it the but with the infield event was it the only one that that you was involved in that made the newspapers no no i've been involved in several um there was another very very good one which we did tried to do at the same time yeah in croydon in a, in a pub which has changed its name now it's the one in the main shopping mall in the center mm -hmm. it used to be called the king's cellars i think it's now called goodies wine bar <laughs> and that that was a fascinating case it was written up very well by by, by colin wilson mm -hmm. who um, sadly died recently and he, he went there and um did a very very good job he, he, he was, turned out to be an extremely good investigator and wrote it up and wrote a whole chapter about it in his book on poltergeist which i highly recommend right, we'll uh, have to look but, at that um dave and liz would like to know have you ever experienced experienced time displacement uh no okay <laughs> quick answer that's easy one yeah. <laughs> um right and uh over the years, obviously, you've been involved in a few things, but on the um, the uh, society side of it, what other pl things do you actually deal with? I know we've had you on for the twin therapy. What other topics do you actually deal with? What other subjects? Well, whatever comes along. I mean, to people, uh, a very common appeal is somebody who, who's heard strange noises or something funny has happened in the house and... Mm. Um, very often we find that the cause is absolutely normal. It's usually plumbing. Yes. Or else expansion joints in, in houses with timber frames. They can make a fantastic racket. I mean, I, I've, I live in a very old house, and um, mm. in the summer you think there's a poltergeist here the whole time. I mean, the middle of the night you can suddenly hear a tremendous great creak and thump, and, and that's, uh, that's caused by beams. And... Um, Mice are fairly noisy around here as well, so um, um, there are all kinds of normal. Uh, but plumbing, plumbing is the main one. I mean, yeah. plumbing can make a frightful racket. I mean, every time my neighbour upstairs has a shower, there's a outbreak of poltergeistery in, in down, down down here, mm. and uh, sort of rumbling and rattling and thumping. And it's, I, I just don't even notice it anymore. So, how are the family now, Mr. Playfair? Well, the mother uh, died a few years ago, sadly, yeah. and um, the two girls are both married and um, living a long way from Enfield. Yeah. And uh, they don't want any more to do with, with the poltergeist at all. I'm no. still in touch with Janet, but I, I've agreed to not to, to let anybody... Um, have her details of where she is or yeah. the whole of her, so I'm afraid she's not available. Uh huh. And, um, <sighs> no, I've completely uh, broken off contact with everybody else except her. Yeah, I understand that. Um, Dave, Dave and Liz would like to know during any of your investigations, do you have, have you ever believed that you may have taken anything home with you? No. Um, uh, I think Maurice uh, Gross may not agree. I think he, he did. Um, well, he, I don't think he took them home. I think they were there already. Yeah. He, he, he was a bit of a medium himself. All sorts of very odd things happened in his house, some of which I witnessed. And um, one or two of them really were extremely peculiar. I think I've mentioned most of them in the, in, in the, my book. But... Um, uh, he, he, he bore up very well. I, I don't think he was uh, permanently affected in any way by, by uh, what he went through. Mm. And um, I think maybe my, my experience in Brazil, where, where the, the local spirits have, have ways of keeping themselves sort of immunized against um, malevolent attack, um, seems to work. And... Um, no, I was having a chat with my friendly local policeman uh, at the time, I remember, and he, he'd just come back from, from covering an extremely violent riot in a, in a picket line. And he, he was saying he, he'd be scared to, to go into a haunted house. I thought, bloody hell, I've 
Mm. I'd be terrified to do what he does. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, confront a mob of screaming uh, yeah. strikers, throwing rocks at him. He thought that was all part of the job. And I said, well, this is all part of mine. I mean, we, we, we have our own specialities. I couldn't do your job, and maybe you couldn't do mine. So um, this is it. that's how society works best, I think, if we all do our own thing as well as we can. Don't try to do everything. This is it. Now, th th when we talk about poltergeist, um, they say that it, it means noisy ghost. Is this your theory, or do you think it's just normal spirit? Well, it's is correct it that pol the poltergeist is the German word. Yeah, is it evil? No, polten simply, simply is the verb meaning to make a, make a racket. Mm. And, um, for example, a, a German for a stag party is a polterabend. It means an evening where you get together and have a good booze up and, mm. and sing song and make a lot of racket and yeah. give the, give the bridegroom a good send off. Um, that that's what Polton means, and uh, poltergeist is simply a spirit um, who makes a lot of racket. And, and um, in the 16th century, they also used to call them rumplegeist, which I think is rather charming, mm -hmm. which means much the same. You know, make yeah. make a tr thorough nuisance of themselves and racket. They are really an extraordinary mystery. I mean, they've been around in all, everywhere, all over the world for centuries. And yet we haven't got a faint idea of what they are, or we don't have any really reliable way of stopping them. No. There are, there's a bit of first aid. If anybody's listening, whoever has trouble with the poltergeist, the immediate thing to do is to separate the family. Yeah. And send the children off to auntie or grandma or somebody, but just, just break the group up. Yeah. Because it, it tends to be a collective uh, group thing. You, you don't get poltergeist if you live on your own. Right. Okay. Can't think of any offhand. Um, so that, that's that's what to do yeah. in an emergency. But of course, it's only short term because as soon as the family come back from grandma, it'll all start again. Mm. Um, but it, it gives you a certain relief, relief um, at the time. Okay, and one more question. Uh, what was the one investigation that you've been on um, that may have made you sit back and think, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think that every day about everything. So, uh, Do you? Uh, I mean, that's, that's sort of, uh, well, I mean, when I, when I decided to be a freelance writer, I... I um, did whatever came along. I mean, initially, to start with, I, I, I wrote whatever I could sell. Right. And I used to do very respectable um, articles about economics and um, balance of payment and, and yeah. oil exports and hydroelectric dams and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, then I discovered the weird side of Brazilian society with all these guys, which I thought were a lot more fun than hydroelectric dams, and so they are. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I just uh, I've written about all sorts of other things, including more recently um, twins, which I found extremely interesting. And uh, yes, it was an interesting interview we had with you. Well, that, that's going very well. We now have a PhD student at um, at London University um, studying twin telepathy, which has never happened before anywhere. Yeah. That's a complete first, and that is thanks to my book, I'm glad to say, and um, that's, that's really very gratifying because I, I do like to do things properly and get useful evidence out of yeah. it. And um, the, the twin research is going very well, and, and it's um, we're working on ways of making it repeatable, which is not easy, yeah. and finding out what kind of twin can do it, which they, not all of them can. No. But it's becoming quite clearer, um, the conditions and also the personalities involved. So we have made a lot of progress in a short time. And that really is, I find, the most interesting thing I've ever done and, and um, certainly planning to, to, to do more. Yeah, yeah, well done for that. So, uh, well, I'd just like to say thank you for um, joining us again today, um, this evening, oh. um, and talking to, about the Enfield ghost, um, uh, Enfield poltergeist, sorry. And uh, it's been a fascinating subject. Everybody really does enjoy it, I must admit, um, because I suppose really and truthfully it, it was a benchmark for some people, you know, to try and find out more about the poltergeist. 
Well, uh, keep your eyes out, ears out for, for an announcement from Sky. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with the, um, with the story. It might be complete rubbish, but at least it'll raise raise the. Um, it's going to be called the Enfield something or other. Yeah, I did see your interview with a, a poltergeist um, on YouTube this week, which was very interesting. Oh yeah, well, well, th this is a. Um, a, a dramatic serial they're doing. I think it's in three parts or something. It's, it's, it's a sort of successor to, to Borgen or the Killing or something. It's, oh, we'll have to have a look at that. It's got a very classy uh, Danish director coming over and all sorts of quite well-known actors, but I, I shouldn't give any details until Sky announces, Yeah. which I'm assured they're about to do. Yeah. In fact, I'm meeting them on Tuesday where they'll, they'll tell me then. So you'll be hearing about it, I'm sure. They, 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 they'll crank their public, publicity machine into action and, and everybody in, probably in the country will know about it. So yeah. um, I should probably run away and hide, I think, but it, at least it's, it's going to make the um, case to revive interest and hopefully sell more books, which is what I do for a living, so that'd be nice. Yes, definitely. Your last book that you wrote on this was back in April 2011, I believe. Uh, well, I had one re reissued. Um, the last new book was the little s short one I did about Chico Xavier, right. uh, the Brazilian medium. And um, I did another one about reincarnation for the Drew's, Drew's Heritage Foundation who commissioned it. Mm -hmm. And that went very well and did very nicely. And um, the twin book is now in its third edition. And... Um, Hopefully one day there will be a new one. Do you have any messages for the investigators out there um, in the mainstream? Uh, mainstream of, of what? You know, the, 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 there's so many investigating organisations out there now. Um, do you have any messages for them? What, what would you, your, um, your best, you know, your best... Uh, Piece advice, advice, piece of advice you would give them. Yeah, I'd say concentrate on the facts and getting them properly recorded. Mm -hmm. and don't worry too much about the explanations because nobody else has got them. No. But what we need is better evidence. Right. And we've now got all these wonderful portable um, cameras and mobile phones and whatever, and the evidence is, is getting better. Right. And um, as the, the Australians demonstrated with that... Um, thermal camera, you know, the modern technology can can be yeah. extremely useful. Yeah. So just, just get, get all the evidence you can and um, let us know at the SPR if you think it's a really good case that need, needs um, following up. Uh -huh. And then uh, write it up yourself and get it get published somewhere. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Playfair. It's been an honour speaking to you again. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> and um, I wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavours. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. And if you have any other... You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, Parasearch UK Radio.